Um, yeah, so the session today is called Music Agreements Part One, your producer, manager, and co-writers, which means there's a part two at uh, some time throughout the year. Um, and I'm gonna head over to some slides momentarily, or maybe even right now. Um, there you go. Um, if, uh, if Joel, do you just confirm that you can see the slides? Yep, they're all coming through, my friend. Excellent, okay, sounds good, there we go. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, or comments throughout, please put it in the chat um, or the Q&A, um, just so we can you know, make this as conversational as possible, because um, I wanna make sure that we're answering any questions that you have. Um, so as I said, the focus of today's session is on producer, manager, and co-writer agreements uh, and those relationships. Uh, just a bit about, um, Bit about the law firm it's called edwards creative law uh head offices here in ottawa where i where i live and where i'm from uh, we have people that are in ottawa toronto peterborough and winnipeg um or a combination thereof to work with uh with, in the music industry film and tv uh interactive digital media or idm as they call it um and uh other creative businesses and individuals so uh, session for today is on, as I said, uh, producer, manager, and co-writer agreements and really the relationships um, between these, these kinds of parties. Um, and relationships is really kind of the, the key thing. The agreement kind of comes second. The first thing is really the relationship that someone has with uh, their producer, their manager, their co-writer. Um, if we have time, we'll get to some uh, relating to an individual's relationship with their band uh, and also with respect to show performance agreements but really it focuses on your producer your manager your co-writer um a little bit of background first oh yeah before i get into anything else this presentation is uh for information purposes only is not to be considered as legal advice please consult with a lawyer to discuss your specific circumstances please don't sue me um because for this reason of this being considered legal advice, this is not legal advice, legal information. I have to say that every time. Um, that's okay. So a few just a few kind of general comments I like to talk about when I talk about music agreements. Um, and these are kind of like some common questions or things that come up um, in conversation with people from time to time. Um, one is what makes an agreement a legally enforceable agreement? And really just the elements of that are that someone is making an offer for something, someone is accepting that offer, and both sides are getting something out of it. it does not need to be fair market value, it doesn't need to be fair, it doesn't even need to be kind of moral, it's just that both sides are getting something. That's why oftentimes in agreements somebody is getting a dollar, it used to be an acorn, uh, just so that you get, just so that it confirms that um, a party is getting something. Um, a verbal agreement is a legally binding agreement, generally, um, except for the fact that as compared to a, writ a written agreement, when there's something in writing, usually there's just a lot more clarity about what both sides are getting and about the circumstances generally. Um, also with intellectual property, it has to be in writing. So that kind of makes it in this context of music law a bit more relevant to have things in writing for it to be legally enforceable. Um, what is planning for success got to do with it? Well, many people write a lot of songs and you never really know which song or which relationship is going to be the one that kind of takes you uh, or, or breaks you into the, the next kind of level of your art. Um, and so since you don't really know which song, for example, that you're working on is going to be that one, uh, it's best to plan ahead for every song you're working on by getting things in writing with the people that you're working with. Um, is it too late to get this in writing? Generally, no. If both sides agree that they want to get something in writing, it's not too late. With respect to uh, a producer agreement, you might uh, try to enter into a producer agreement with a producer that you worked with a few years ago on an album or on a song uh, because you want to just clarify things in writing now, even though it all happened years ago. Um, similar thing with a co-writer, similar thing with a manager. Um, Last thing on this little slide here is about the, the, what I call kind of the three royalty buckets that are, that are relevant uh, in our conversation today. There's money that you might make as a writer. There's money you might make with respect to the master recording of a song. And there's money that you might make with respect to your performance on that song. A lot of people 
are able to collect money from all those three buckets directly. Sometimes you might have someone else involved who's kind of collecting for you and then pays you something. But really, at the end of the day, there's these are kind of the three main ways that a recorded song um, are going to earn some money and they impact uh, a producer agreement, a co-writer agreement, and a manager agreement, among other things. Um, who else is signing? This is probably the most important thing, uh, who you're working with, um, especially, well, in all cases, but maybe especially the man management agreement. Um, doing your due diligence on who you're working with is really important. Um, you want to make sure that, especially in the management context and also producer context too, you're working with the right, per right partner. It's the right time. It's the right project to work with that person or company. Um, oftentimes what I might say is that it's more important to be working with a really great partner and having a not so great agreement as compared to having a really favorable agreement, but working with a really bad partner. So who you're working with is of most importance. When I get asked to review, let's say a management agreement, before I look at the agreement, I would say, well, who are we talking about here? Who is it that you're looking to uh, play this management role for you in your, your career? And um, you know, what, what kind of research can you do about this person before considering entering into an agreement with them? So who you're working with is really important and it really kind of supersedes or is more important than most other things with respect to uh, agreements with them. Um, some agreement challenges in general, again, this is kind of a general thing, but um, there's oftentimes inconsistencies between what you're told is gonna to be in some agreement that you're getting versus what's actually there. Um, and so one of the things that I look for when I'm reviewing an agreement for somebody is, is getting the full spectrum of kind of what they were told, like what their expectations are about what's gonna be in this document so that we can make sure that the actual document is consistent with what they were told. Uh, most of the time, it's not entirely consistent. Usually it's fairly consistent. Um, if there's inconsistencies, it's either because someone is lazy or because someone's trying to you know, do something that they shouldn't be doing or somewhere in between. Uh, lack of clarity is an agreement challenge. If things aren't clear, you wanna make sure, or it, I think it's a good thing to make sure that things are clear so that there is no ambiguity about what you're agreeing to. And patience, uh, not, maybe not an agreement challenge, but maybe an agreement process challenge that everything generally takes longer than what you'd like. Um, well, not always, but most of the time agreements take just a lot longer to be, to be prepared and to be, to be reviewed and just to be signed as well. Um, sometimes you might think that it's you know a really important document that should everybody should it should be their first priority. No one else should do any do any other work. No one else should sleep or eat until this is done. Well, that's just not kind of how a lot of agreements get done. Um, sometimes agreements I'm involved in take days if it's really fast. More likely, it's weeks. Sometimes it's months. Um, it really depends on the circumstances, but you want to try where possible to be patient, knowing that. Um, it's going to take longer than what you expected to get something done. Um, those comments are kind of sometimes more aligned with some of the other agreements you might have with like a record label or a publisher, but same, the same goes with, with the producer agreement. Uh, I'm working on a, at least a couple right now that the process started weeks ago and we're just waiting for feedback um, from various people involved. So it does, it does take time and uh, patience is... Uh, among other things, it's good to be patient if possible. Just recognize you may need to be. Okay, so producer agreements is the first one I wanted to talk about because really I think it's kind of the most common that I would see as compared to some other ones. Um, even a co-writer agreement, I mean, they're common, but uh, a producer agreement is a very common doc type of document that should be in place. Um, or that the terms of which are discussed between people when they're getting someone to produce a song or produce a, an EP or full-length album. Um, first question, like, what is their role? And different producers, especially in different genres, um, play different kinds of roles. Um, I'd say, you know, let's say in, in, in hip-hop versus folk, um, in hip-hop, a producer might be more you may be relying on them more to to actually produce an underlying beat whereas um, in, in other genres in, in, including folk you might bring 
uh, a melody you know to a producer who's going to help build it out um things some logistic things to figure out what's the recording schedule what's being delivered to you are you getting stems for example like what exactly are you getting from this producer uh, and the services is, is the scope that they're um you know in, well engineering it and and playing a typical producer role uh, and recording it or are they also mixing it are they also mastering it if you have an expectation that a producer is also mixing a song or an album you'd want to clarify that that's within the scope of what they're doing um, and as a producer uh, you also want to make sure that you are limiting uh, or providing clarity on what limited services you are providing so whether you are the producer or whether you are the artist or whether you are let's say the manager for the artist who's working with a with an the manager for the artist working with a producer, you want to make sure that there's a lot of clarity around what actual services are being provided to the artist. Uh, producer terms, money and, and composition. So money first. So um, ideally, um, and for those who just joined us kind of more recently, please ask any questions or add or any comments to the chat. I'll try to integrate them into the discussion. Um, producer terms, it's definitely, it should be a lot more than what you know, the artist is paying to the producer, the conversation should be about more than just that. However, with respect to that money that the producer is being paid, when is it being paid? Is it being paid in part on delivery or acceptance of the of the of the deliverables? For a producer, you'd rather be getting paid as much upfront and you'd rather being paid, you'd rather have the rest of your payment be made once you deliver what you think is the finished product. But as an artist or someone representing them, preferably part of the payment is due once you've accepted or once the artist has accepted uh, the deliverables as fully completed. Um, is the fee plus tax or not? That's oftentimes a relevant, a relevant consideration, especially regarding just cash flow of what you're paying the producer. Um, and is any part of the fee considered as an advance? And we'll kind of get into that in a second regarding what that actually means, but preferably as the, preferably as the artist, uh, some or a lot of sometimes typically half of what you're paying to a producer is considered as an advance against certain other royalties, meaning that um, if you pay the producer, for example, $2,000 and 1,000 is, uh, is considered as an advance, if you owe the producer $1,000 in future off of uh, music royalties that you don't actually pay the producer that $1,000 because, because what you were paying them initially was considered, or at least $1,000 of it was considered an advance against future royalties. If the future royalties were, were $3,000, then if 1,000 of the initial fee is considered an advance, 3,000 minus 1,000 is 2,000, so you pay them 2,000 later on. Um, so again, preferably as the artist or representing them, you'd wanna have as much of the fee as possible be considered an advance. Um, next item here is the composition. So what percentage of the composition if any is a producer getting as their share of the song if, if any um, and sometimes it's somewhat implied that they won't be a part of this and sometimes it's somewhat implied that they will be um, but it's important to talk it out um, as soon as you can to clarify um, if the producer is going to be entitled to a percentage of this composition that's being um, created together or that's being produced by this producer. Um, if the producer is getting a share of the composition, preferably for the artist, the artist gets to make all decisions about the producer's share because if an artist is giving the producer a share of this composition, preferably the artist doesn't have to go back to this producer later on to get approval to do anything. So preferably, even if you're sharing some royalties or some, you know, some, let's, let's call it some some SOCAN royalties, et cetera, with this producer, um, preferably you don't have to ever go back to them to get approval to do anything you want. Um, jumping to master royalties. This is kind of the, the more, um, and I don't wanna say the word complicated because I said complicated once in a session and it didn't, uh, it's, it's not a word that is appropriate. More importantly, the, the master royalties, the money that's earned from the recording, there's a lot of different ways that a producer fee can be calculated. There's no one way that it is. There's a, just a variety of different ways. And the challenge I have 
but that I see is that there's different under there's different because there's different types of ways this can be calculated, and because a lot of people just kind of sometimes don't know entirely what they're talking about, um, they might agree to something that they don't fully understand and don't appreciate, and it's inconsistent with their general expectations of what they are owing to someone else. And kind of the, the typical situation here is that a producer might say that they want three points and you are thinking that that three points means 3% of the profit that I'm receiving from this song. And those two numbers, even though the number three is included both in the word three points and in, in the, well, the words 3% of profit, they are different. They are not the same thing. Um, and so it's important that the revenue um, formula that you have to receive master royalties is consistent with what your producer is entitled to and is getting. Um, another related concept in the ways that this, these formulas can be set up is the concept of record one. Um, it's important to figure out when you're paying a producer, how that money is being calculated, um, and the concept of record one means that even if you're delayed in paying a producer, you're calculating their, their royalties as of when the music started to be uh, exploited, started to be used. The alternative is that you might get some money from your music, pay off all of your expenses, and then after that, of the profit you're receiving at that point, at that point, you're paying your producer a certain percentage of, of money you've received. So those two methods like something being a producer royalty being paid to record one or producer not being paid to record one significantly changes what you would what an artist would would owe uh to a producer and what i sometimes recommend people do um regardless of what a producer's uh agreement might say is just to kind of create an Excel and like put some numbers through the system and, and, and think about, or just look to see um, what the numbers would be if you were following what a producer wanted, um, wanted to earn and see if you think that's reasonable or not. And so, I mean, we're, we're kind of talking about this as like an artist getting an agreement from a producer. Um, but if you are a producer, uh, same thing. I mean, you want to be able to have the formula be consistent with what, um, you think is reasonable and what you think you can have the artist agree to pay you. Um, most, I think most of the people that are in this conversation are more on the artist side um, and would be getting a, a proposed agreement from a producer or would be just discussing terms with a producer. And so I think a good starting point is to say to a producer, what are your expectations of, of me and this music? And what, what exactly are you asking for me? What do you want me to pay to you in return for your work on this, on this song? And, that, and that's kind of a good starting point. I mean, if they say, well, I don't know, what do you want to pay me? You know, preferably you're paying a producer a specific fee and nothing else. But if the producer is agreeing to do this project, so long as they have some kind of uh, upside on this project, if it works out really well, you know, these are the kinds of, these are the kinds of ways that a producer royalty can be calculated. Uh, and maybe the first thing I should have said on the slide is, you know, what exactly are we talking about regarding master royalties? We're talking about, most of the money that's generated from streaming, from downloads, obviously from physical productions, although I shouldn't say obviously, but from physical. I say matter here, I meant to say master, sorry about that. Uh, master use fees uh, with, is with respect to money that's generated from when a song is placed into let's say a film or a TV show or, or an ad campaign or a video game. Um, owner share of digital performance royalties, that's um, same thing as that's neighboring rights royalties. So the money might come from connect here in Canada or sound exchange in the United States. Um, and this is the scope of what we're talking about when we're talking about master royalties that a producer might be entitled to. Um, oftentimes the question is, well, what's reasonable or like, what should I, you know, what should I propose to this producer? They want to be paid, a, they, 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 they want to get, you know they want to share in the in, in the in the uh, in the money this song or this album makes if it actually if it makes if it makes money you know what should I offer to them um, and it really depends on the situation it depends on what you've paid them up front if anything um, I think I get to this in a bit of a later slide but 
the more you pay them up front, a little less reasonable that, that, that they're also entitled to a, you know, a good share of the back end royalties. Um, oftentimes people work with, not oftentimes, but sometimes people work with producers and the producer just like, there isn't any money really to pay the producer up front. And so you agree to provide them with a share of the royalties, the song makes. Um, if you, as the artist are, you know, much further ahead in your career versus a producer who's just starting out, but you still want to work with them. Um, you have a bit more leverage or clout in that, in that, you know, the contractual relationship or in the relationship of, or in this, in the, uh, the discussion about what the producer should be entitled to. If the producer is some big name producer and you really want to work with them and you think having their name on your song is going to do really, you know, going to lead you to, you know, get a lot more awareness for this song or this album, you're likely willing to give them more than what you would otherwise give to somebody else. The key thing is having clarity about what is actually being paid. I mean, the key thing is, a key thing is, is having some clarity. Oftentimes I see agreements that I wasn't involved with at the time that I'm trying to help a you know, client understand later on. Sometimes they're just, sometimes the formulas are so badly written that they are not clear about you know, what the formula is. So proactively, um, if you as the artist can work with your team to figure out you know, what is appropriate and how, how should we clearly state what the, what the producer is getting like that, that will serve everybody well. Better to have clarity now versus um, you know, on something that's not clear in future. Um, another question to figure out when you're figuring out this producer agreement is how often is the producer given a report about what they're entitled to and how often are they paid? Might be once a year, might be twice a year, might be quarterly or monthly. Preferably as the artist, you're not paying them that often, um, like annually or so. Preferably if you're the producer, you are you have uh, payments that are happening much quicker, reports are happening much quicker. Um, it's, let's say your artist favorable is to pay. Yeah. So from a cash flow perspective, preferably the, the producer isn't paid anything until you actually have money to pay them. And it's, and their entitlements are not calculated back to record one. And as a producer, it's preferable that um, somebody, some other person like a record label uh, pay the producer as soon as possible and to have their entitlements be calculated uh, to record one. So sometimes you kind of land somewhere in between. Um, but if you're, if, if you, the artist or the artist representative are dealing with a producer who is not as, um, let's say sophisticated and doesn't have, you know, a team to help them out. Um, ideally your revenue formula is one that's artist favorable. Um, so that you are, you know, providing something to your producer, but you're not, um, in a situation whereby, for example, you have to pay the producer before you have money to pay them. Um, some other issues with producer, some other considerations with producer agreements are these, um, I, I kind of already talked about the first one. Second one I kind of alluded to is a letter of direction. So a letter of direction is a document whereby an artist says to their label or says to anybody else, um, you aren't obligated to do this, but what I'm asking you to do is to pay the producer directly instead of paying me. Um, that's something that is oftentimes included in a producer agreement where the artist is with a record label. Um, it's just something that is, it, it provides the producer with more clarity that they'll actually be paid if there's money to pay them. It also reduces the administrative burden on the artist. So, you know, th those are two good reasons why someone would want to have a record label um, or pay the producer directly. Um, this came up recently. What if you want to reduce the scope of services? So I'm working on this producer agreement that's for, let's say, 12 songs, and I represent the artist and we're agreeing to a set fee per song. But I, what I wanted to add to the agreement was that, well, if we decide during the sessions that we just want to do, let's say, nine songs or 10 songs, then we're going to reduce the fee accordingly. That wasn't agreed to, but at least that was the ask there, um, that, we, that we can, as the artist, reduce the number of songs that are being um, recorded and produced if we so decide to do that. Samples, um, kind of maybe not as relevant in, 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 in folk music generally, but you know, you want to make sure that the producer is confirming that they're not putting any samples into the song without your approval. Um, 
grant of rights to artists. So this is kind of a big one uh, because if the producer doesn't actually grant you their rights in their in their work, the producer continues to own them until they they grant you their rights in writing. So um, a really important part of an agreement with a producer is that the producer is giving you their intellectual property with respect to the recording. Remedies refers to what someone can do if they feel like they want to come after you because they don't feel like they've been, for example, you know, paid appropriately. Um, this section of an agreement would limit what they can do. It would essentially say that they can't stop you from distributing the music. They can they can sue you, sure, but they can't they can't stop you from exploiting the song that, you, that they're that the artist is is exploiting, which is a really helpful clause. If you uh, you know have let's say a producer who feels that you didn't pay them appropriately, you don't want the producer to go and like tell tell your label or tell let's say DistroKid or CD Baby that that you can't that they have to stop distributing the song. You want to make sure that the producer is contractually saying they won't do that. And you know not everybody you work with is going to be here in Ontario, um, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that your agreement with them can't be based in Ontario, preferably. Uh, Ontario artists have their agreements be governed by the law of Ontario, whether the producer is based in, you know, Gatineau, Winnipeg, or New York, um, or wherever else. Yeah, it just provides you more protection in case there's a conflict with that person. Uh, here's, I, I wanted to include some sample clauses so you can see what some of the stuff actually looks like in an agreement or what it might look like. Um, and this, this is a clause that I wrote regarding uh, the credit that a producer would get. So it says producers shall receive a produced by credit in association with all masters. No inadvertent, no inadvertent failure to provide credit is considered a breach. So if you kind of by accident don't include the producer credit, um, you still have the rights that the producer gave to you. You haven't, the agreement isn't over because you forgot, for example, to credit them. Um, it goes on to say that essentially you will try to fix the error moving forward if it wasn't done. Uh, also, all other credit decisions are made by you. Um, and the producer is granting you the right to use um, their name to credit uh, in association with the song. The, the last comment I have here is, is whether the producer is also going to be given by also going to be given a written by credit, uh, which may or may not be relevant in the circumstances. Uh, here's a clause called the entire agreement clause. And really, without reading this whole thing, what it's saying is that everything that's with everything that the producer and artist have agreed to are in this agreement. If after they signed it and the producer or artist says something to the other person on the phone or by text or by email or whatever, that's all nice, but it's not actually part of your agreement. The only thing that's part of your agreement is what you've agreed to in writing here or any changes that you've made in, in, in writing with the other party. So may, you know, maybe, um, you maybe modify all of our written instruments. So if there were to be a change, you would want to have a formal amendment to your agreement, um, which isn't that complicated to do, which is something to do where you both sign this change to your terms, uh, as opposed to relying on what someone said to you, you know, verbally or by text. So this, this is a pretty common and useful uh, clause in really kind of any agreement, including a producer agreement. Um, Next one is remedies. I think I talked about this a bit. So um, yeah, this is this is kind of the clause I mentioned earlier that if someone's essentially mad at you, what they're what you're getting them to agree to proactively is that they're not going to try to stop you from continuing to exploit your music. So without kind of reading every word here, that's that's what we're getting at. And you know, speaking of these words here, if anyone wants the slides afterwards to see some of these clauses, just send me an email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat here, but um, it's also at the end of the slides. But I guess if you don't have the slides, then it's hard to see the email to ask for the slides. So here's the email in the chat. Um, so that's that's what I want to talk about of a producer agreements. I wanted, you know, it, it is kind of halfway through the session. I think it's kind of uh, that that makes sense because it's a pretty important document or arrangement um, with your producer. Um, if anyone has any questions about what I've talked about or any other questions relating to producer agreements, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, if not, we can kind of come back to it at the end of the discussion. Um, but I hope that provides a bit more clarity. I mean, if you take away anything, and I know that like, you know, watching a session for an hour, especially about, you know, legal stuff, it's impossible to retain everything. Um, 
but you know, that's why kind of getting a copy of the slides would be helpful maybe, but the one takeaway really is just to talk about these things with your producer, or if you're a producer to talk about them with your art, the artists that you're working with. Um, because having um, expectations about the other people, having expectations about what the other person expects is a pretty scary situation when a song starts to do very well. If you, you know, if you, if you are an artist and you're getting a song produced by somebody and the song is never like put out there into the world, then it doesn't really matter so much about, you know, your arrangement with your arrangement with your producer, but you know, if you're putting a song out into the world and it's doing well, and it maybe is becoming one of your top few songs or becomes kind of the biggest thing you've ever done, uh, if you're going to be very appreciative that you got these things figured out proactively, because if you don't, then the producer is likely going to say to you, well, you know, I never really gave you the rights to the song. So I want to, you know, I want to renegotiate what you're giving to me, or I want to negotiate what my entitlements are to the song. And they're likely going to end up being a lot more than what you would have otherwise given to them if you figure this out proactively. Um, so that's that's my kind of two cents on that. To talk, I mean, it's good but in all these situations to talk to the other person uh, about about these issues, but um, talking and then formalizing and writing what what your deal is between the two of you it doesn't have to be written up by a lawyer. It can be, but just the starting point is what everybody is is getting out of the arrangement. Um, I'm going to switch gears to management agreements. Uh, but again, we can come back to producer agreements if anyone has a question at the end. And as Joel says here, the session's also being recorded, so you can, you know, if you really want, you can watch it again later on. Um, or if you have any questions, you can let me know. Um, okay, management agreements. So similar comment to earlier on, a manager is essentially, you're essentially getting married to your manager, um, which is, uh, well, that's just kind of how it goes. Um, so you want to make sure if you're the manager, if you're the artist, that it is the right fit um, that you're working with, with the other person. And I know from like the list of participants here, there are people on this chat who are both, well, some are some play a management role and some play an artist role. Uh, maybe some play both. But, you know, as the manager, you don't want to be, let's say, wasting your time on an artist who has completely, you know, unrealistic expectations about, about their career and isn't going to listen to you and just you know, doesn't focus on their art. And as an artist, you don't want to work with a manager who is not going to give you their time at the time of day. So, you know, with respect to both the manager and the artist, you want to make sure that the other person is the right fit for you at the time. Um, and as someone who's, you know, a respected member of the, the arts community, not someone who's has a really bad reputation um, because, you know, their reputation rubs off on you. Um, when should they be signed or when should they be, be prepared and signed? So, I mean, preferably earlier than later in the relationship, but again, you want to have time both as a manager and as an artist to make sure that uh, it's the right fit uh, for you both. Day-to-day um, -day versus big opportunities. So um, with some people, they have uh, two managers, someone who kind of is more active in their day-to-day -day life and one who another one who's kind of more focused on on bigger opportunities for you sometimes that's the same person sometimes it's separate people sometimes these people work together sometimes they don't as much um, but if you're talking to someone and you are you know who wants to be your manager talking about what the scope is of what they're going to do is really important you want to make sure you're on the same page about what they're going to do you might already have someone who's kind of helping you with day-to-day -day stuff, um, you know, answering you some email, dealing with, you know, some social media stuff, just kind of helping to do the million and one different things to do. Uh, and you might want to enter into a more formal agreement with, with someone who's out there trying to seek bigger opportunities for you. Um, you want to make sure that these people, if they are, if they are separate, separate people, that they are able to kind of play together uh, that, and that they, you know, want to work together. Um, I'll leave it at that, that there are different kinds of management roles and sometimes it's rolled into one and sometimes it's not. 
sometimes you might, you might have a manager who's kind of the bigger opportunities manager and they have someone who they work with as like a junior type person who's handling more of the day-to-day stuff. And if you're entering into a deal with the bigger name, the bigger person, the bigger opportunities person, you know, you want to make sure that you Uh, those are the two most important words in this discussion. I see here it says my internet is unstable. Is it back? Uh, it is. Back? It is. Okay. Uh, you cut out and then you said these are the two most important words. Two most important words. words. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joel. <laughs> so good timing on that. The, the drama here is on par. Uh, so, I mean, as you can see from the slides, it just says right fit. Um, you know, if you take, if there's two words that you take out of the session, it's just, you want to work with people who are the right fit for you. It's not exactly rocket science, but it's something that is good to get reminded of every moment of the day. Um, so let's move on. So, um, services and term, two really important aspects of a management agreement. Um, what is the, I mean, this is, this kind of relates to what I just talked about. What, but what, what is the manager actually doing? Like what, what are they doing? And having clarity about that is really important. 10 different managers might kind of define the scope of what they do differently. And that's good. You know, not every manager is the same and they shouldn't be. Um, different managers have different areas of expertise. Uh, some are more focused on, you know, touring. Others are more focused on um, like production, paying for, paying for recordings and getting it distributed. Other partners have different, other managers have different strengths. You know, what is the manager doing uh, is a really important aspect of a management arrangement. And as a manager, if you're talking to an artist about what you're going to do, I think it's a good idea to really kind of at least speak about the kinds of things you do do so that you can better ensure that, that the artist wants you to be doing those things. Um, and it also relates to how you're being compensated. But overall, important to clarify what the manager is actually doing. Um, although my first bullet here says, are the manager's services exclusive? Meaning, can the manager also work for other artists? And the answer is typically yes. And the artist should really be, you know, acknowledging that. Um, and as an artist, you know, if your manager has 102 clients who are all in different countries of the world and all in different genres, you know, that may not be the best scenario to be in. You may want to work with a manager who, who has a, a bit of a smaller roster, which is a bit more kind of, you know, um, specific to your genre uh, or that maybe works with clients in a couple different genres and not like all over the place. Not that there's anything wrong with being all over the place, sort of, but you may want to, you know, make sure that you know who's on the roster. You want to know, you know, if you want to make sure that you're the right, the right fit for this team. If you feel like you're the odd person out, you know, maybe, maybe that's a sign that this management team is not the right fit for you. Um, Who's providing the services? Key person clause. Okay. So if you're an artist entering into an agreement with a management company, a corporation, like not Byron Pasco carrying on business as Pasco management, which obviously does not exist, but like if you were entering into an agreement with like Pasco Management Inc., that's not me. That's a company that I happen to own. And so, and I may have other people that work for me that you don't know about. And so you might want to have a key person clause in your agreement, which says that if the main person you think is your manager is not providing um, ongoing services to you, you have the ability to leave that relationship. Which again relates to like, you know, who are you entering into this deal with? Are you entering into a deal with a individual or with two people who collectively have this partnership? Or are you entering into a deal with a, with a company which may have people come in and out of this company? Um, so it's important to always look to see who is actually the other party in this deal. And if you're a manager, you know, it might make sense that you have a management, that you have a corporation. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a good thing, but you want to make sure that your clients know, or your artists know that, you know, you're entering into a deal with this company of which I am a owner and, you know, I'm committing to you that I'm going to be providing services, but I'm not the only one who's going to be working on your file and your, your, your career. It's not just me. It's, I know I have a team of people. If that team of people might be two people, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not just you. So having clarity about who you're dealing with is a good thing. Um, 
approvals, power of attorney. So as an artist, preferably um, you want to be approving perhaps everything that your manager does for you. And as an, as a manager, you preferably don't want to have to go to the artist to get approval over everything or ideally not anything. So it's a good idea to clarify, you know, what the manager does, which requires the artist's approval and what the manager does that does not require the artist's approval. Um, power of attorney relates to the ability um, that the artist is giving the manager in a contract, which would um, formally give the manager the ability to uh, sign on behalf of the artist. And there's a lot of different relevant kind of stipulations with that. Um, but as both an artist and a manager, artist or manager, you want to make sure that um, the details of this power of attorney are appropriate. Um, for example, as an artist, you wouldn't want to be giving a power of attorney to a manager to make decisions about like um, perhaps your health or perhaps like having the, this power of attorney last longer than your management agreement. So there's kind of a, a variety of little elements of a power of attorney. Not all powers of attorney are created equal. Um, term. So this is kind of a big question, usually in the context of management agreements. How long should this thing last? Um, for a manager, preferably you want it to last longer. For an artist, you want it to typically last shorter, like have a shorter duration so that you can really assess things after you know a shorter amount of time. Um, there's no kind of right or wrong answer about how long a term should be. I think typically they're kind of, I see most of them between two and three years. Um, I think, well, I'll leave it at that. It, but it really depends on the people that are involved. Um, and what's the process to end the term early? You know, perhaps going back up to our key person clause. Well, if the manager is not active in, in your, with your career, perhaps you have the ability contractually to end the term early. Um, Ideally, in any agreement, there's a process whereby someone has the ability to terminate. Um, the related concept is what's called a cure provision. So your agreement might say that if the manager or the artist does something offside, that they have time to fix that issue so long as they're notified about it. Um, but yeah, that's the, the term is really the length of time for which you as an artist are committing to this manager and the length of time that the manager is committing to, to be the manager of this artist. Payment, kind of a big part of any management agreement. Um, what's the manager entitled to? Uh, it might be a percentage of royalties. It might be a, a monthly consulting fee. It might be a kind of a hybrid whereby the artist pays the manager a set fee, which is an, an advance against potential royalties. As we know, uh, it takes a long time for an emerging artist to generate revenue, uh, a lot of it. And so, you know, figuring out the right um, way to compensate your manager is an important part of the discussion of, of you know, of figuring out if someone's the right fit for you. Um, if someone's getting a percentage, uh, sorry, I said that with a weird way, they're getting a percentage, what is it? A percentage of is it a percentage of everything is it of all entertainment activities is, is it all music activities does it include the fact that you teach music on you know sundays at this music school you know that probably shouldn't count um but if you're writing for somebody else that probably should um if it's if the scope of your deal is entertainment activities well what if the artist happens to also have this modeling career on the side or happens to have this acting career that they're kind of pushing. So, or what if they are developing a video game, you know, on their time off. So, you know, what is included in the scope of what the manager is getting and what should be outside of the scope of what the manager is getting. Um, the commission can vary based on a variety of things, including like the first X amount of money the artist gets the commission is a certain percentage, and if it's more than that, it's a different percentage, that, that's fine. I mean, anything is fine, but that, that's an option. Type of revenue, you might get a certain percentage from bookings, but you get a different percentage from um, writing royalties. It doesn't have to be the same percentage for everything. What's the cash flow? So for an artist, preferably the artist gets paid and then they pay their manager. For a manager, they might want to be paid um, the artist's entitlements, and then the artist gets paid by the manager. It can really go either way. Um, 
sometimes there's a role of a business manager, which we didn't really, it's not really in the slides here, but the other kind of manager role that an artist might have is a business manager who assists with kind of everything financial, including but not limited to paying your, you know, regular manager. Um, expenses and loans. So if the manager pays for stuff on your behalf, there should be clarity about, you know, how the manager is paid back. Um, sunset clause. The most two interesting words in any agreement. Um, so this relates to, uh, hopefully there weren't any eyes being rolled, uh, et cetera, but um, this is all about what a manager might be entitled to when the management agreement ends. Um, and my comment on sunset clauses is that I think they are reasonable so long as they are reasonable, which kind of means nothing, but hopefully means something. And it means that I think a manager should be entitled to earn uh, revenue after the management term ends, so long as, for example, the manager has helped the artist to really get to that next phase of their life, their career. And also so that, and, and I think what's also reasonable is that the, the fees that a manager is getting are not excessive. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I've probably written and reviewed well, many sunset clauses, none of them are the exact same. They're all fairly, they're all a little bit different from each other, but typically um, they might include a percentage of royalties earned from music that was written and or recorded during or before the term and or from revenue generated from agreements that were entered into or substantially negotiated during the term. So you may want to rewatch re the session for that sentence, but typically, you know, what is the manager getting after the management term ends, really to compensate the manager for getting you to that, you know, at that point in your life. Um, it's to avoid the concept of, of an artist, you know, working with a manager for years, having a really big opportunity come up, and then fire their manager the day before, fire their manager the day before they get this big new deal, because they want to, you know, avoid paying the manager a commission, which is a pretty kind of well, possibly unreasonable thing to do. Uh, and having a sunset clause helps to protect a manager from that. Um, we could talk for an hour about sunset clauses, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if you have any questions, you can you know, let me know. Um, and for the last kind of, you know, five, six, seven, eight minutes, I want to talk about co-writer agreements. Unless anyone has questions about management stuff. Um, co-writer agreements, at the end of the day, can include a lot of things that might be in a producer agreement. Um, they typically don't include all those things, but they could. You know, if two people write a song together, they can agree to whatever they want to agree with regarding money that, that, that a recording of the song would make. But typically a co-writer agreement starts with figuring out what the sharing of a composition is going to be. Um, and that typically relates to what is the the split of the composition that each party is entitled to, whether it's two or 20 people who co-wrote a song together. Um, I'm gonna to jump to a sample split sheet and then kind of come back to this slide. Um, this was a set of slides I prepared a while ago for something else relating to kind of, you know, what might be in a split sheet. And a split sheet is kind of the only agreement for now anyway, that I think would be not horrible to get from the internet. Um, but here's kind of an example, and I'm happy to email you a split sheet if you want. Um, so it would say the name of the composition. It would say what the credits are of the composition. So who's, a, I mean, it, this may not be known at the time, but you may just have, you know, your, your written by credit figured out, you know, and whether it's like uh, Sarah and Shauna or Shauna and Sarah, like that may make a difference to one or the other person. Um, so, you know, the order of, of things is kind of important sometimes. Um, typically I wouldn't find a split sheet that says who owns a master, but I like to put that in there because sometimes, um, it's, it's good to have clarity about kind of who owns the recording that's being made of the song that we're writing together. Um, oftentimes there is no recording at the time, so it's not as relevant, but you know, if there is a recording that's going on at the same time as the songs being written, being written, uh, it would be not a bad thing to clarify who owns the actual recording. 
Um, who, composition controlled by, this is also something that I, I kind of added into a typical split sheet because, you know, let's say that, um, let's say that uh, Tara and Teresa, I'm just reading names of people who are attending here, the Tara and Teresa, uh, you know, co-wrote a song together, which Tara is performing and Teresa is the co-writer. Um, Tara and Teresa might decide that as between the two of them, that Tara makes all decisions about this composition or they might decide that they need to mutually make decisions about this composition. If, if Tara is the performing artist and Teresa is her co-writer, it's in Tara's best interest to have all decisions about the composition be made by Tara. And it's, in, it's in Teresa's best interest that Teresa and Tara collectively make all decisions about this composition. So um, if you don't have this little composition controlled by clause or line, then really, whoever co-wrote the song, each collectively, like collectively you control the decision. You can't you control the decisions. You can't make decisions on your own. Even if it's like 99%, uh, you know, Jojo and 1% Jeremy, that doesn't mean that Jojo can make decisions about the composition without Jeremy's um, approval. It also might be considered like a veto right that Jeremy has, even if he has 1%. Like everybody who co-wrote the decision, who co-wrote the composition, Unless you agree otherwise, you all each have the ability um, to stop a decision being made about the composition or put another way, you all have to give consent to the use of the composition. Um, if you have a publisher, you might put your publisher in, into your split sheet. Many split sheets are, are just kind of written up with the names of the writers, whether it's you know two, three or 30 people. I had that once where it was like 30 people, it was a really ridiculous situation, but Nothing wrong with that. You can have as many people as you want. Preferably, you include people, even if they're getting 0%, but they felt like they might be a part of the song. So um, the, the so-called Nashville split is really kind of everybody in the room is equally sharing this composition. But if you don't want it to be that way, you know, if, if Tara and Teresa are writing a song and like Shauna's there, you know, in the room being a supporter, um, Tara and Teresa might want Shauna to agree that she's getting 0% of this composition. It really does, you know, protect Tara and Teresa, not that Shauna would do anything about this, but like, um, I'm just saying people's names here. We're not like making assumptions about anybody. Um, but like if someone's in the room and you feel like they might say that they had something to do with the song later on, get them to confirm that they have 0% of the composition uh, and to sign that they have 0%. So, you know, I'm happy to send this little split sheet here, but um, again, more important than, well, equally as important or just as important or, you know, to figure out before you sign something like this is, is just clarifying with your co-writers what the split is of this composition. And the related question is, well, when should this be done? And preferably it's done at the time. Um, I was at a, a like a, a writing workshop retreat thing a couple of weeks ago, and like after every song was was kind of demoed for the for the group, the people who co-wrote the song signed a split sheet, and just confirm what their percentages are of the song, and like that's that's like a nice simple way to do it. It's like at the time, it doesn't mean that you can't go back and do this later on. It's just that it's a lot easier to do at the time. It could be a bit awkward, um, but um, doing it at some time is better than not doing it at all. Talking about it is better than not talking about it. Um, we're, we're trying to like, you know, make things, um, move things from kind of one end of the spectrum to the other. One, one, end of the, one end of the spectrum is like not talking about this stuff at all. The other end of the spectrum is like having a, an agreement with all the, all the writers. You know, preferably you're just moving towards the end of the spectrum of like getting things formalized, but at the very least talk about, you know, what the splits are in the composition. That's a better, that's better than nothing for sure. It's not the best case scenario, but it's better than the worst case scenario. Um, is a split sheet enough? So, I mean, no one, no one's ever really asked me that, but this is kind of the question that I ask myself, or I kind of, you know, kind of pose out into the world when people sign split sheets. I would say uh, no, it's not enough because there's no actual mechanical license here, but it's a lot better than nothing. Um, I think that these additional elements and of a split sheet, like who controls the recording or the composition, 
who the master is owned by, if that's relevant, like those things kind of help to provide some clarity. Um, but, you know, well, you know, because I'm saying it, if, if two people said to me they want to have a, you know, a co-writing agreement, it would be more than what's in this split sheet. It would provide for a license to use uh, someone's share of a composition. Like if two people are, are writing a song together and one of them is a performer and the other one is their co-writer, preferably for the performer, the co-writer is granting a mechanical license to use this, their share of the composition and also to be the first person to use it. So first use mechanical license. So a uh, split sheet is great. Uh, do I think it's like the best possible thing? No, but it's still pretty good. Um, and ways to determine splits. Um, I mentioned the Nashville split thing. Sometimes what happens is that the people who co-wrote the words share half, the people who, who co-created the underlying melody share half. Um, that's one way to do it, but there's no rules on what it has to be. Um, people can agree to take 0%, even if they co-wrote something, they might agree to take like some money in return for taking a lower share or taking no share at all of a composition. So there's no real, there's, there's no rules against any of that stuff. The key thing is just having things discussed and then formalizing it in writing in some kind of way. Uh, including, but not limited to, this kind of split sheet. Uh, last bullet point here is about credits. And I mentioned that before, like writing out what the credits would be and also just the order of things. It doesn't have to be, you know, biggest percentage first, it doesn't have to be alphabetical order, it can be whatever you agree to. Usually it makes no difference, but sometimes once in a while it becomes an issue. Um, if you're working with somebody who demands to be listed first, you know, maybe they're not an easy person to work with on a variety of things. There's, there's nothing wrong with being listed first, just you know, good to kind of clarify things. Um, I'm gonna just really quickly just show a couple of slides about some other stuff. Um, these are some other agreements that might be relevant for you and your team. Uh, a band agreement, most bands don't have them, most bands should have them, but they don't. Um, I wrote a blog with about a hundred questions that you might wanna ask each other for band agreement, but here are some of the considerations um, focused really on decision-making and how revenue is being split. Uh, online performance agreements, these kind of are more common these days when performances are online versus kind of an in-person show. Uh, here are some considerations, including um, who actually owns the recording, how long it's gonna be made available online, um, a radius clause, whether that's relevant or not, meaning, you know, you can't perform um, in the same geography with the geographies online. So it's kind of hard to, to, uh, to do that sometimes, but just clarifying what your limitations are with respect to other performances. Um, those are some online performance agreement considerations. Uh, and here's my info, uh, email and some links to some blogs. Um, links to social and all that fun stuff. Uh, and if you want a copy of these slides, please uh, send me an email. Uh, email is in the chat um, at the end there. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, does anyone have any questions on any of the things we talked about? So we talked about, just to kind of recap, we talked about producer agreements, we talked about manager agreements, and then we talked about uh, co-writer agreements in the context of uh, split sheets. Um, if no one has any questions, that's okay. Um, feel free to kind of check in later on if you have any questions about these things. Uh, the role of a music lawyer, um, including like myself, or to either to review these kinds of agreements if you're given them or to, pre or to prepare them for other people to sign. Um, and uh, happy to chat with you about any kind of situation like that but also on the, on my website, on my blog, I have kind of some additional information about all of the kinds of agreements that we talked about today.